Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I so look forward to this day over all the days of the week. The sun has been shining. The weather has been wonderful for November. And God is still on the throne. Amen? Amen. Even after all the knuckleheaded election stuff, God is still on the throne. He's the boss of all things. He's in charge. He's still large. And so how great is our God? We will rest in that. Well, this morning we're going into one of the most precious chapters in the Bible, chapter 8 in the book of Romans, which is Paul's gospel, uh, essentially, but it's a very long theological explanation of how God behaves with us as human beings, and it's uh, something that deserves our attention and some excitement, but first, let us pray, because I need it. Father, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your love for us, Lord, that you did not have to give. You did not have to do a thing for us as we are rebellious, born that way, and how our hearts are contaminated and our world is mismanaged. And yet, God, you love us so much that you sent your son to die for us so that we wouldn't suffer the penalty of our sin. And so, Lord, we stand before you free. And as your word says, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Lord, I thank you for what you've done for those of us that know you and for what you will do in those who don't know you yet. I pray that you might use this day to make an eternal difference in all of our lives. You know our heart, Lord. You know the concerns we have, you know, the thoughts of our mind and the words of our lips before we ever speak them. Take this time, Lord, and pour yourself out into us through your word that we might live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, today we are visiting verses 9 to 16. I thought I would go all the way to verse 27, but it ended up being much too rich. You know, you, you can't eat like a giant piece of fudge on top of another giant piece of fudge, on top of another piece. You'll get sick, so I don't want to make you sick, but you'll, you'll be just overwhelmed to the point where you won't know what to do. So... Let's pick it up from Romans 8, beginning in verse 9. This is life in the Spirit, which in our world of Middle Eastern contaminants and thoughts from the whole Asian world, what to be in the Spirit means is so incredibly cloudy, and yet the Scripture is very, very clear about what that looks like. And so we're going to talk about that today because Paul introduces us to the Spirit. Beginning in verse 9, but you are not in the flesh. Everything he said in chapter 7 towards the tail end about being in the flesh and being ruled by the flesh and under the slavery of sin, he says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption 
by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. What a great testimony about who we are in Christ and the opportunity we have to live in the Spirit instead of living in the flesh. So just to go over what we went over previously here at Grace, we've been looking at the book of Romans. We're in chapter 8, which talks about sin and sanctification. We've gone through all of this, and uh, soon we'll be pressing in on Israel, their past, their present, their future role in God's economy, and uh, moving forward. Last week, we went over verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh, much like an animal might. They just think about eating, drinking, repopulating, and having fun. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. We talked about the role of the body, the soul, and the Spirit, how without the Spirit of God causing us to be born again, we have a spirit that is not enlivened, it is not strengthened, and it has not been born again. And so what happens is your body rules your soul. What shall I eat? What shall I wear? Where shall we go? How shall we spend our money? Uh, what's the newest thing that I can spend my money on for my gratification? And we live for the, the body. And the body basically determines what you're going to do, where you're going to go, how you're going to live. And if you can gain some control with your soul over it, you can live a pretty decent life if you submit to some of God's laws. But when God gives us a spirit, he gives us his spirit inside of us. And that then takes control. That's what it is to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. It's to be controlled by the spirit of God inside of us. And he's the one who controls our soul, which is our, our thoughts, our desires, um, our affections. And our body is just going to have to wait. Amen? Amen. That, that's what I say every time I come up here and I say, oh, I should have went to the bathroom before I came up here. <laughs> Just going to have to wait. And verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death. To be, have your mind centered on the things of the flesh, of only the desires of the body and the affections and appetites of the body is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Can I get an Amen. Amen. Having your mind adjusted by the Spirit of God so that you're thinking the way that God thinks makes everything easier, including an election. Because God's ultimately in control, is he not? We're supposed to pray for our leaders, are we not? I wonder if we're praying enough. So, it means death, or if we walk in the Spirit, it's Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So those are the things that naturally come out of a new nature in somebody who's been born again. What comes out of the flesh is here in Galatians 5.19, which we talked about last week. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It, it wars against God. It's in natural rebellion against God. And it's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. Those who do not have an experience where they have an encounter with God and they become born again and have the Spirit of God inside of them do not have the capability of doing the right thing. They might be able to do it for a little while. They can read a self-help book, be inspired for a week or so. They can go on a diet and lose 10 pounds, but then they gain 20. It's just the nature of our human nature if you are governed by the flesh. It's just the way that it is. And we cannot help but to be rebellious and be like Bart Simpson and just see something that we're told not to do and just do it. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God because we are morally bankrupt. Morally, we have nothing to bring to the table. We don't have any power to do the right thing. And so we don't have what it takes to come to the table unless God does a work in our heart. And I'm so glad that he does because we would have no hope otherwise. Amen. A self-help book isn't going to cure you. Sorry. Or a college education isn't going to make you happy. Or the new Lamborghini, which I thought just might, but no. So, beginning in verse 9. So you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. He's speaking to believers. This isn't for the human beings. These are those who have placed their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior. If 
Indeed, the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. The Spirit of Christ, notice, is synonymous with the Spirit of God. And you're going to see those are somewhat interchangeable. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit himself. You're going to notice they're all synonymous. They're all talking about the same person. The Holy Spirit is a he, not an it. It's not, you know, you don't, you don't pinch your fingers and meditate. and it, It's not a thing. It's not, you're not tapping into some strange magnetic resource of the earth or Mother Nature. This is the Spirit of God, who is a specific person of the Trinity, as the Scripture teaches. What does the Bible mean when it says to be in the Spirit? And we, we see it. Uh, with some of the prophets as they speak, we see it with John in the book of Revelation. It says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I had a vision and this thing happened. What does it mean to be in the spirit? That means I was well fed, I was well rested and I had a happy day <laughs> or the sun was shining. That is not to be in the spirit. That's to be happy, but that's a very surface thing and could change the first cloud that shows up. Being in the spirit is being in tune with God's heart. And we have the mechanism, the Holy Spirit of God inside of us that we can do that. You know what it is to be in the Spirit and not to be in the Spirit. Some people say, well, you woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Well, you can't stay that way. I mean, although you can get off on the wrong side of the bed literally on a particular day, but it doesn't mean you stay that way because the Spirit of God lives inside you and you can't. You can't. You ever try to stay angry at somebody? <laughs> Oh, I can't be mad at you, you know. <laughs> what does it mean to be in the Spirit? And what does the Spirit do? Because there are lots of opinions on what that's all about. And so I'm going to give you 33 ministries of the Holy Spirit very quickly. This will not take long. <laughs> he helps, he guides, he teaches, he speaks, he reveals, he instructs. He testifies of Jesus. He comforts us. He calls us. He fills us. He strengthens us. He prays for us. He prophesies through us. He bears witness to the truth. He brings joy. He brings freedom. He helps us obey. He calls for Jesus' return. He transforms us. He lives in us. He frees us. He renews us. He produces fruit in us, spiritual fruit, and he gives gifts. He leads us, he convicts us, he sanctifies us, he empowers us, he unites us, he seals us, he gives access to the Father, he enables us to wait, which is patience, and he casts out demons. Just to give you a quick overview of some of the things and the offices and ministries of the Holy Spirit. And so as we go into this, you can remember that. Number one, the scripture says here that we are not in the flesh. In other words, we're not ruled by our appetites, our thoughts, our imaginations, our fears, our upbringing, our economic strata. We're not. We're not ruled by that. Amen? Amen? Okay. So we're not in the flesh. He dwells in you, by the way. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it says that God sends his Holy Spirit in you. So God, a piece of God is in you. You're not him. I'm just making a difference for some of the megalomaniac, uh, egotistical human beings that may hear that and say, that's right, I'm God. No, you're not God. He's God, you're not. Try, stop trying to take his job. But he dwells in you, which means we have communication with God. The spirit is the spirit of Christ. And you'll notice that they're somewhat synonymous. He arrives at salvation. There are a lot of people that might argue that, but the scripture says here, you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if you do not have the spirit of Christ, then you're not his. That's simple. If you know Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't have Christ. He comes at the same moment. It's not a subsequent later falling like, hey, I made Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. And then years later, I received the Holy Spirit. It's not what the scripture teaches. You get the Holy Spirit when you get saved, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Can I get an amen? amen? Okay, because there's a lot of confusion. Now, can you be filled with the Holy Spirit? 
like one of the prophets say, I'm in the spirit on the Lord's day. I'm especially tuned in with the Lord. And guess what? That's when he will communicate and say something to me because I'm listening. I believe in the outpouring of the spirit many, 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 many times. Like every Sunday morning. Because that's what I need, because otherwise I'm a mess. It says here in John chapter 14, Jesus says a lot about the Holy Spirit here through the next three chapters of John. So I'm just going to read through some of them so uh, we can get through the rest of the passage today. Verse 16 in John 14 says, And I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper. Notice the capital H. It's referring to the Holy Spirit. That he may abide with you forever. By the way, if you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and the Holy Spirit enters you, he's there for how long? Never. Forever. Never. Forever. Why? Because you feel that way? No. no. Because you don't always feel that way, do you? No. And yet the scripture says so. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Amen. Right? Amen. Just, so this is proper doctrine. Just, just trying to keep it clear here. Forever. So, and he's in you. Not out there. He's in you, which has some interesting implications I think we should talk about. 1 John 4, 4. You are of God, Jesus says, little children, and you have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Who's he speaking of? The Holy Spirit of God. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So that's why you can handle anything, right? As long as we pray about everything. Right. He's in you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. He's speaking to his disciples before his resurrection. For he dwells with you and will be in you. Jesus said to his disciples, listen, you guys know what's going on. The spirit's among you. He's over you. Epi is the, is the Greek word, but he will soon be E-N, N, he will be inside of you. So even his disciples who were there, who walked with Jesus, didn't have the Holy Spirit inside of them until after Jesus was resurrected, second chapter of Acts happens, the Holy Spirit falls on everybody, right? You're following me, good. I don't want to take a lot of time going through things you already know. Whom the world cannot receive, he dwells in you and will be, he dwells with you and will be in you. Revelation 3.20, behold, I stand at the door and knock, Jesus says to one of the churches. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him. Isn't that interesting? He's talking about a house and a door. Then he talks about coming in to him. The spirit of Jesus Christ knocking on the door. You get a sense that he wanted to come in, but, he, but the door was closed, maybe even locked, dead bolted. That's what he was speaking to this church. If anyone, he's speaking to the entire church, but he's speaking individually. And he will come into him and dine with him and he with me. What a privilege it is to have a relationship with God and his Holy Spirit living inside of us so that we might know the mind of Christ. That's one of the implications of it. That is, that's the, the FM antenna, if you will. The frequency modulation that helps us to understand what God's will is. And my heart is God's home, as the scripture says, and as the book is labeled. So is Christ at home in your heart? If you have the spirit of God, then you're his. If you don't have the spirit of God, then you're not. So is Christ at home in your heart? Because that's where he said he would go. He said he'd go in you. Of course, we don't mean the pump that's moving all the blood around. We're talking about the, the very core of your human being. Uh, in the old King James in 1611, they called it the bowels, your gut, like having a gut reaction. So he dwells in you and will be with you. In verse 20 in John 14, he says, at that day, you will know that I am in the Father and you and me and I in you. There are some people that twist the scripture and say, oh, so you're equal in power and glory to Jesus Christ. No. But we are one, one in heart and one in spirit. And that's a very different thing, isn't it? So don't, don't let any of those cult people throw you off. John 16, 13 says this, however, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. That's one of the functions of the Holy Spirit, to guide you. 
How often do we rely upon the Holy Spirit for guidance as opposed to our own wisdom or our own knowledge or our own resources? For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, for he will tell you of things to come. So not only does he instruct and he helps us to know where we're going to go, what we're going to do, and how many of you really want to know what God's will is for your life? Your best life now I'm going to show you. The Holy Spirit will. And the knowledge of God's word will certainly help in that. So he's our helper. He's our teacher. He's the one who reminds us of everything that Jesus has spoken. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, oh, I'm sorry, in John 15, 26, he says this, but when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Notice the Holy Spirit is always a he. It's never an it. It's a he, always. And notice the Spirit comes from the Father. So it's the Spirit of Christ and the Spirit of the Father and the Holy Spirit individually. Well, which is it? Yes. It is all of the above. When the Helper comes, he shall send from the Father the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. He will testify of me. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 16 says this, But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit, These, this is wisdom and knowledge and understanding of who God is. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. So the Spirit in you searches the deep things of God. So is there anything you can't know? Hmm. <laughs> Verse 11, for what man knows the things of a man except for the spirit of a man which is in him? And so no one knows the things of God except for the Spirit of God. And where is the Spirit of God? In you. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, because otherwise I wouldn't know. These things we also speak, not in words of which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches teaches. One of the functions of the Holy Spirit is he teaches. Anybody ever come to you and say, how did you get to know all the things that you know? Well, I have a college degree and I've been everywhere. I've done everything. I'm a Rhodes Scholar and I have lots of friends in high places. And well, What about the Holy Spirit? Is he involved? I'll tell you what, five spiritual words would be better than a thousand words of junk. Sorry. I could go off at any moment. <laughs> it's an election year. <laughs> These things we also speak not in words of man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned, just like we read earlier here in Romans. They can't submit to the will of God, they don't understand the will of God, and they're unable to. Those people, you're done having a conversation with, I hope. Oh, but I'm a good arguer, Pastor. You don't know. I was on the debate team, and I can, can, I can convince anyone they need Jesus Christ. That's one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit. Don't be God. Let God be God. They are spiritually discerned. For he who is spiritual judges all things. By the way, with the Holy Spirit, you'll be able to discern and understand things that you wouldn't otherwise in the natural. And that's pretty cool. Yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. Because there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who don't walk according to the flesh but the Spirit. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But... We have the mind of Christ. What does that mean? Because I don't feel like I have the mind of Christ. I'll tell you what, sometimes I say things and you guys go, oh, how did he know? <laughs> I didn't. I felt like you were talking right to me today, Pastor. <laughs> I have no idea. But the Spirit of God knows what you, know, what you need, Amen. and he knows where you are, and he'll give me the things to say if I'm in the Spirit. If I'm in the flesh, I'll just say a bunch of junky things, and I'll be like a comic up here, and I don't want to do that. 
So, this is what it is to have the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 16 and 17 says, I say then, walk in the Spirit. That means that you don't go somewhere you shouldn't go, <laughs> that God doesn't want you to go. You don't willfully take off and say, oh, I got a shortcut, I'll go this way. It means you walk in the Spirit. You go according to the plan. You check the map. You're not going off the GPS. I walk in the Spirit. And you shall not fulfill the lust of your flesh. So what happens if I'm struggling with my flesh? It's because I'm not submitting to the Spirit. So if I walk in the Spirit, if I'm willing to be obedient to do those things that God wants me to do, I won't do those things that make me embarrassed afterwards. Sounds like a simple equation. It's a much harder thing to lay hold of. But you've got to prevail upon the Holy Spirit of God to change your heart. Verse 17, for the lust... The, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. So that you do not do the things you wish. The person that has the Holy Spirit of God, you have a restraining device on you called the Holy Spirit, like a giant rubber band. <laughs> have you ever been willful and said, I don't care, I'm going to do this thing. And you go and you like... <laughs> Oh, uh, maybe, maybe I won't. <laughs> it's too much. But I'm so mad at them because they did. Uh, Lord, you're right. You forgave me all my sins. And what else am I going to do? I got to forgive them. Do you, do you feel the, you feel the draw of the flesh and then the rubber band pulling you back? That's the Holy Spirit of God. So that you wouldn't do the things that you wish. It's kind of like having bumpers when you go to play, when you go bowling. For those of us that don't bowl well, <laughs> would you like the bumpers, sir? Well, absolutely. Thank you very much. <laughs> I do. Well, that's the Holy Spirit of God, making sure that something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. He's a guide, and he's the one who helps us that we, that we can actually hit some pins so that we don't mess it up. And, you know, that's what it is when you have the bumpers up, right? It's like a circuit judge in the brain. Uh, one, one songwriter wrote, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is like a circuit judge in the, in the brain where... Your flesh might say, hey, you know, it's a good idea. You should go. No, you, you don't want to do that. Like Judge Judy. Uh, uh, uh. The Holy Spirit does that because he reproves, he rebukes, he corrects, he trains. He does all of that. And hopefully he's got something to draw on you because you've taken the word of God in. You put it into your mind and your heart. And the Holy Spirit actually has a resource. He could pull a file and open it up for you in your mind and say, remember, Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. And because, because the judge is there, you cut it out. It's like a leash. It's a leash on your flesh, the Holy Spirit is. He keeps you from doing what you would otherwise do. We have two dogs at home, and we can't let them outside unless they have a leash because they go everywhere seemingly at once. <laughs> They have to smell everything, eat anything that is remotely organic or inorganic, and they have to be leashed, right? Mm -hmm. How about you? Yeah. I need a leash. I got protections on my phone. I got protections on my computer. I live with a woman who constantly watches me. <laughs> She's watching me now, I know. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit of God goes with you everywhere and is a leash so that you would not do what you otherwise would. And aren't you glad? Yes. I'm glad God made a change in my heart and he stops me from doing the stupid things that I would otherwise compulsively just be a slave to do. But I don't submit to the flesh, I submit to the Spirit of God. And he's got my life. So, we got through one whole verse. Isn't that great? Wow. That's great. <laughs> now I'm going to fly. <laughs> verse 10. And... If Christ is in you, the body is dead. Your body's dead? Your body's dead. Yeah. You're dead to me, body. You're dead. <laughs> Your body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit, who dwells in you? Notice the active agent, the energy, the dynamic of God is accomplished in us by the Holy Spirit. 
And it seems like nothing is apart from that. How appreciative should we be? How in touch should we be with the Spirit of God? In Colossians 3, 1 to 6 says something very similar. And then you were, then, if then you were raised with Christ, and by the way, you were, if you know the Lord, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth, because we don't live according to the flesh. For you died, by the way, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. Because you don't do all those things that you would otherwise do. You do those things which please the Father, right? Then, when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. You see the exchange? He died for you, we die for him. Amen. And when that happens, we get to spend eternity with him. And the life that we would otherwise have here on our own, which would be just this big in light of eternity, is much bigger. Therefore, put to death your members. By the way, that's all the parts of your body, all the component parts, which are on the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is, ooh, I want, I want, I want, which is idolatry. Because, see, there's no contentment in that. There's no recognition of God's leadership. There's no recognition that your body is dead. It's just living for the flesh. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. These are the very reasons that God's wrath is going to be poured out. And so we shouldn't have anything to do with those things. And we shouldn't be living in the flesh. Because we're dead. There is no resurrection without a crucifixion. It was so for Jesus, it's so for us. There's no resurrection without crucifixion. And that comes through the Holy Spirit of God inside of us. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. That's the spiritual death where you're separated from God for eternity. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Any of you seemingly have a death wish in your past? Where people said, what are you, crazy? You're going to drink and snort and smoke and do what? You're going to try to blow up your car by going as fast as it possibly can go? Really? You're going you're gonna to try this insane thing? You're gonna, any of you ever do insane things like that? And people say, what's wrong with you? Do you have a death wish? A few of you. Okay, well, I, I did. And I'm glad I'm over that part of my life. If you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. If not, there's just an eternal separation from you and God forever and ever and ever in a place that was never designed for human beings. It's made for the devil and his angels. So you can spend your life right now, or you can invest your life right now. How many of you are spenders? Financially, you take cash, you enjoy shopping, you like you like Amazon, the internet, Wayfair, all the people that send me those things, I go delete, 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 delete. <laughs> yeah, spenders, spenders. There's a difference between spending and investing. Investing, you don't have to worry about paying your bills. Spending is something that we all have to do, at least for the, the minimum things that we have in our life. But some of us have a problem spending. That's why I don't use a credit card. Because you spend it and you don't feel it. <laughs> you go, I got this cool thing. It got delivered to my house. It was like Christmas, Amazon. And you can just do it again and again and again and again until you get the bill. And you go, whoa, there's a couple zeros too many in this. <laughs> I don't remember spending. Oh, yeah, there, there it is. And it's stuff that's still sitting in a box in the corner. <laughs> Spending, And you know, your life is that way. If you spend your life on those things that are temporal and on the flesh, you will be very disappointed. And the payment is for eternity. So why not invest your life and do those things which please the Father naturally by the Spirit of God that's inside of you? It seems to me like the best deal. If you remember Samson, 
the story of Samson, somebody that God called even before he was born and the spirit was upon him to make retribution upon God's enemies and God's people's enemies. He was chosen by God to do a certain task, except he was ruled by his members. He was a fleshly man. And although God and poured out a spirit upon him to perform certain things, he really did not have a reverence for God. And so we see that he gives in. You know what his weakness was? Women. Not the first time a woman would be a weakness. Not the last. But it was his own self-control and his commitment to God. That was his weakness. You know, if, if you have a weakness and the Holy Spirit is not in charge of you, trust me, it doesn't matter what it is, you're going to fall. It doesn't matter. But he lived his life for himself, for his flesh. He, he wasn't supposed to, he was set apart for God's use from the very beginning as a Nazarite. A Nazarite, you don't cut your hair, you don't handle dead things, and you don't have anything to do with grapes. The fermented beverage, the non-fermented beverage, the grapes on the vine, or grape skins, actually. You don't have anything to do with grape leaves. You couldn't go to a, a, a good Greek restaurant and have grape leaves. I mean, you're, you're just away from all that stuff because you're set apart for God's use. And those were symbols on the outside of what should have been happening on the inside. Well, we see him choosing women unwisely and forcing his parents into getting married and we see God warns him because he's walking through a vineyard. And it's a place that you should never be if you've sworn off grapes. Um, he's in the middle of a vineyard and God sends this lion out to attack him. And instead of thinking twice and saying, whoa, maybe I shouldn't be going to this girl's house to marry her. <laughs> because he wasn't led by the spirit. He takes this lion and he destroys this line and tears it apart and leaves it on the side of the road. We know that the scripture, whenever it talks about the line of Judah, it's talking about Jesus. It's a very symbol of the Holy Spirit of God saying, uh-uh. And yet he disregarded it and it ended up on the side of the road. And then he ends up digging into that lion later and eating honey out of the carcass, which is another picture of doing something he shouldn't be doing, is handling a dead carcass. So, it, it just continues to go. It's a fascinating story if you're in the book of Judges. But here's a man who just compromises. But he's also full of fear. Because he never knows what's going to happen. So he takes this lion and he kills this lion, which is an amazing thing to me, that somebody could kill a lion with their bare hands. Uh, needless to say, it was a young lion. But even so, not something I want to do. If you remember, he gave into his flesh with this woman, Delilah, and she was a plant as all temptation is, by the way. And there are people orchestrating that, which is the same as there is today. We have an enemy. And what they did when they finally caught up with him and he got his hair cut, which is a symbol of him completely turning his back on God and not being committed at all in any way, shape, or form, what ended up happening is they took his eyes. They gouged his eyes out, which is one way of debilitating somebody so that they can't possibly... Um, fight effectively, but he lost his eyes. The very thing that caused him to sin. Jesus says, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and throw it from you because it's better for you to enter into life maimed than it is to enter in eternity with all your members. And he said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it from you because it's better for you to enter into life being maimed than to enter into hell with all your members. Anyway, I digress. And so what he does as a final act is once his hair begins to grow back, he doesn't let them know that his heart is actually in tune with his hair growth, and he begins to commit himself to the Lord again. And he says, God, just let me, just one final act, let me be used by you to destroy all these Philistines. And he's in this temple where these Pillars are close together and he's able to get some leverage and the spirit of God comes upon him and he's able to tear this thing down and all of the people that were mocking him and in a way mocking God, they ended up dying. So that's the story of Samson. He was led by the flesh. And he should have been led by the spirit. Any one of us could fall into that category. And there are side effects to everything that we do. 
So we need to be careful. If you die physically to yourself and you just deny yourself those things that you know God would not have you have, then you'll live. And that's evidence that the Spirit of God lives in you and you have a relationship and you've got a home. So you either live now and die later or you die now and live later. It's, it's one choice or the other. You can either invest your life in living for God now and have an eternity or you can spend your life and do whatever the heck it is that you want to do, be miserable and happy, and then at the end of it all, have to stand before God and be judged for it. It seems to me to be a clear choice, right? Yes. Yep. Verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So one of the evidences that you're a Christian has nothing to do with church attendance, Bible reading. Bumper stickers. <laughs> Christian mingle. It has nothing to do with any of those things. If you're led of the Spirit, that is a defining characteristic of somebody that knows God. Is that the Spirit of God leads you and tells you what to do and you say, okay. So, the leading of God. You know, you have to be careful who you follow. Right? Right? You have to be careful who you follow because you never know what they're going to do. You know, there's this new thing now where people who want to collect insurance money will zip, cut you off, get in front of you, and then just jam on their brakes. Do you know this? It's true. Well, there's a problem. You have to be careful who you follow. Anybody who's being a psycho, I get away from them. I either fall way back or I pass them and go way ahead. I just, they're an accident waiting to happen. I just don't want it to happen to me. So you have to be careful who you follow. And there are a lot of Christians who follow human beings who follow God more than they follow God. They're more committed to ministries and personalities than they are the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a problem. Not a problem to look up to people, people to be examples, but only in the way that they're in the shadow of Jesus Christ and they look like him and talk like him and do those things that God has led them to do. But don't put your faith in human beings because you'll be very disappointed. Amen? Amen? Don't even put faith in yourself, in your own wisdom. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll direct your paths. Right? Good. Hang on, I must be doing something wrong. How does that saying go again? <laughs> this is what happens when you put the cart before the horse, and you're the one who's driving. You have no... But if you're following the Holy Spirit, you have the power and the direction that you need to do those things that God asks you to do. Proverbs 29, 18, I have the New Living Translation here. When people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild. But whoever obeys the law is joyful. When you are willing to do those things that the Lord wants you to do, you'll notice his blessing goes along with it. And when you don't, you're going to have trouble. It's just the nature of it. It's a bit like a lighthouse. The Holy Spirit is the one who warns us of things that we shouldn't get involved in. And sometimes they're completely innocuous. They're not damaging or uh, on the obvious poisonous, but they're things that the Spirit of God will say, don't do that. Like you come ac across a homeless person and they're looking for money and you feel bad for them and your heart goes out to them and you say, you know, I got, so I got some cash. And then the Holy Spirit goes, We've had, I was in New Brunswick as the assistant pastor in Calvary Chapel, and there were people that would come up daily on a Sunday, and they all had stories. So funny how you can unwind them. It's funny how the Spirit of God will speak to your heart and say, something smells fishy. And there, there are certain things that you can do to figure that out too. But anyway, you want to obey the law. You want to obey the law of God in your heart when the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart because you will be sorry down the road. And you'll say, I knew it. I, I knew I shouldn't have done that. Have you had that experience, anybody? Uh, willing to confess? Okay, good. Good. I'm not the only one. Like a conductor, the Holy Spirit will, will give us the beat, and he'll give us the intonation, and he'll tell us when we're in, and he'll tell us when to be quiet. And the Holy Spirit is the one who guides us. The more that you understand the word of God, the more that you understand his word, the better your filing cabinet is where he can pull it up and show it to you. And you go, oh, yeah, I remember that verse. Like 
when you're feeling like you're not good enough, not smart enough, you're a dirty dog, God can never love you. Romans 8, 1. Therefore, now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who walk according to the Spirit, not the flesh. Yeah, that's right. And you end up preaching to yourself. You guys preach to yourself? I, I preach to myself much harsher than I would ever talk to you, so you should be glad. Hosea 4, 6, God says this, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being priest before me. He was talking about the people themselves being the one who would intercede and be the messenger of God to the world. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. When we don't follow the leading of the Holy Spirit and we don't do those things that God calls us to do, it has far-reaching effects in our family, in our relationships, in our world. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. You want to be led by the Spirit of God. Number one, it's evidence that you have God in your life, but you want to follow the Spirit of God because this world is much like Mount Everest. It's full of treachery and danger. And if you don't have the right guide to get you through this, you could end up like so many people on Mount Everest who don't make it. This is a, a crew of uh, people that went to the top and they actually put up a weather station. So you could, you could key in on the weather and you could find out. They have gusts of up to 175 miles an hour on the peak of Everest. Some people get blown off the mountain as they're climbing. It was 43 below the other day. Anyway, you can tune in and you can, you can check these things. Uh, I'm so glad I live in New Jersey now, no matter what the temperature is. <laughs> but you don't want to go up there and not have a guide. Uh, there, there are more than 300 people that have died climbing Everest. There are over 200 bodies still strewn up on Mount Everest. If you ever go up there, by the way, it takes you about thirty to forty thousand dollars to climb the mountain, with guides and shipping all your stuff up there, and food and oxygen tanks and all of this. It, it, it'll cost you between thirty and forty thousand dollars. If any of you were thinking of a vacation, <laughs> um, it's a very expensive vacation, and the, the the mountain is incredibly crowded these days because everyone is doing it. Apparently, um, by the way, if you can see very carefully. This is a long line of people up to the peak of Mount Everest. This is a large group that went. The permits to get on the mountain are ten to $25,000 a piece. Go to Hawaii. <laughs> but see, it's, it's a challenge, and, and it's kind of a boasting right, too. You know, I climbed Everest. Uh, of course, I took the southern, the southern route is much more negotiable than the northern route, and it, it, you have the same boast as the person who came up the north side, uh, but that's the one that usually takes all the peoples. It's in the Himalayas, and it's on the China side where they have trouble, not Nepal. In case you were wondering and wanting to go, I'm trying to direct you. But you want to have a right guide. You don't want to go doing this thing alone because there are over 200 bodies that are strewn up there that they can't get down. Uh, because of weather and obviously just getting yourself down alive is a challenge. And of course they have ice, uh, ice falls that happen there. There's ice that falls off the mountain and uh, it's, it's bad news. So you want to have a good leader as you go through things. And the Holy Spirit is uniquely qualified because he knows the mind of God and he will tell us. And then we have the mind of Christ. And so we want to follow him when he says something. So who do you choose to follow? If you go on your own intellect, let's say you read up on Mount Everest and you knew all about it and you knew there's 175 mile an hour winds that whip up and blow you right off that thing. And, and so you bring lead weights with you. And, you know, like, let's say you were really well prepared and you were going to climb up there and do all that. There are people that have done it. There was a woman who was climbing for 27 hours straight. She ran out of oxygen and none of the people on her team would help her and she died. And that's going with a good guide company and having all the equipment. So when the Spirit of God says something to you like, hey, don't go up to Mount Everest. <laughs> it's a good idea to agree. Yeah. But there are other things in our lives that the Lord speaks to us and he says, 
don't, don't do that. And it could have far-reaching, you know, side effects. Just like that. And so following the Holy Spirit, not being given over to the flesh, not allowing your body to scream at you, tell you what to do and be reined in by the flesh is something that we have a tremendous honor to have the Holy Spirit of God inside of us. And Jesus did that so that we wouldn't be orphans, he explains. He says, I have another helper and I will send him so that you won't be an orphan. You won't be alone. You won't be without a guide, a helper, a teacher. But if you don't have the Holy Spirit of God, then you're none of his, the, the scripture says. If you have the Holy Spirit, it's evidence that you are his. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Abba is an Arabic term which means daddy or papa. That's the spirit that God's given to us, not Judge Judy, the literal Judge Judy. I don't care. You know, the, that's not the spirit of God speaking. That's probably your, your own self or maybe some derogatory uh, person in your background that told you you weren't good enough but the Spirit of God always comes in love. He didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind, it says in Timothy. Now, I think about people throughout the scriptures like Barak. Barak was a general, and he was afraid to do that which the Lord told him to do, and so he went to Deborah, because Deborah was a prophetess, and she would speak for God. And he says, listen, Deborah, I, you know, I, I know I'm supposed to go to war, but I'm afraid. Will you go with me? And she goes, I'll go with you. But you know a woman's going to take the credit for all this instead of a man. And he goes, I'm okay with that. <laughs> because he was afraid. He was afraid to do that which God told him to do. And it's funny, a, a woman did get credit. It was JL. <laughs> JL got all the glory because she put a spike through the, the other general's head. Fear is not from God. But didn't you hear about the elections? Fear is not from God. But you don't understand, I just lost my job. Fear is not from God. Well, I just came from the doctor and I got diagnosed with fear is not from God. I just figured I'd let you know that. Because you may run into something and suddenly your first instinct is, I can't handle this. That's true. Amen. But don't let it seize hold of you. You might be in the midst of moving. And your closing day gets pushed back. You, I don't know what you're in the middle of, but here's the bottom line. Fear is not from God. God has not given us a spirit of fear or of timidity, by the way. So... We, we need to battle that, even as Barak had to battle that as a general. I think about Gideon, who was trying to make himself a little granola to eat a meal, and he was hiding out from the Philistines who were coming and, you know, stealing everything that they had. They were jumping him. And a, an angel shows up and says, oh, mighty man of God. <laughs> this little guy in a hole. Right? God has often chosen the least likely person to be a hero. Like you. Like you. Like Moses, who thought he was all that in a bag of chips for 40 years and ended up deciding he could kill somebody and get away with it, because he was. And he ended up having to be put out to pasture for 40 years so God could take the Egypt out of him when he took him out of Egypt. And then when he's 80 years old, he appears in this fire, and it's interesting. Moses says, check that out. There's something on fire up there, and it's not being consumed. I'm going to go check that out. You know, Charlton Heston said it in a nicer way. <laughs> but he went and saw, and the Lord said, take off your shoes. You're, the ground you're on is holy. And he says, I want you to go and deliver the people. He spends three chapters telling God why that ain't going to happen. <laughs> God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love. And a 
sound mind. Thank you very much. That was the group participation. <laughs> I think of the disciples on the ocean. Jesus said, okay, guys, let's get in the boat. We're going to the other side. And so they're going across the Sea of Galilee. And a storm comes. And I understand they come very quickly on the Sea of Galilee. I've never been there, but it'd be nice to go someday. Even if I was in a storm, I'd be cool. As they're going across, the clouds come, the thunder, the lightning, the rain, and the sea whips up, and the waves begin overlapping the boat, and they can't seem to control it. And without the wind going in the right direction, you don't dare put a sail up, and with winds that gust that badly, you don't put a sail up. And so they're basically stuck, feeling like they're uh, you know, fish in a barrel being shot at. Peter goes and wakes Jesus abruptly, by saying, Lord, don't you care that we're perishing? He was asleep. I don't know if you've ever been awakened rudely, but Jesus was. And so if you get awakened rudely, he knows what it's like. Well, he gets up, wipes his eyes, looks around, and he says, be still. Silence. By the way, that's the way he speaks to evil spirits, too. Same wording, which makes me wonder what the cause of the storm was, because it disappeared instantly like glass. And the disciples all looked at each other and said, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? They didn't get it. They didn't know who he was. You do. If they knew and believed what Jesus said, we're going to the other side, they, they had a couple of options. They could have enjoyed the ride. <laughs> Woohoo! They could have enjoyed it. <laughs> or they could have waked him up far earlier. <laughs> hey, look, there's clouds coming. Look, what do you want to do? Don't worry about it. We're fishermen. We know what we're doing. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him who's in the boat with you, and he will direct your paths. Should have woken him up a long time ago, and not so rudely when they were just on the edge of death. But that's what we do when we pray, isn't it? Like a fire extinguisher. We don't, we don't need God unless it's really bad. Call on him often. Call on him early. Do what he tells you to do when the Spirit of God speaks to you. Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. It is an inside job of what God does with us. He changes our heart and our mind, as it says in Ezekiel 36, verses 26 to 27. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, one that can respond, one that is tender. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. The only way that you have an enablement to be able to obey God is because of the spirit of God. And so we are not alone. The spirit of God is in our lives. It says in 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells within you? Do you not know that you are the chosen dwelling place of the God of heaven? It makes you think about what you're going to do with your body. In fact, the scripture says if you, if you as a Christian man join yourself to a prostitute, you are taking the pieces of Jesus and joining them to a prostitute. The Bible is that clear about it. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13 says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. By the way, don't work out anyone else's salvation. Work out your own salvation. I can't believe, look what she's wearing. I can't, I can't believe that. And uh, why does, what, what about, uh, you can work out everyone else's salvation. Not really. 
with fear and trembling. So there's a deep humility in which we come before God and do those things that he tells us to do. For it is God who works in you through the Holy Spirit, obviously, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So do you have trouble putting your heart behind something that God told you you should do? Sometimes I do. I didn't want to wake up and my alarm went off. But the Spirit of God helps me to do those things which I know the Lord would have me do. Or I'd still be sleeping. The Holy Spirit is the one who helps us to will, cause us to want to do those things, and to perform that which he asks us to do. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're stuck. You're a slave to your sin. You're a slave to your body. There's nothing you can do. But if you're a Christian, you're dead to your body. Your body submits to your soul and the spirit. That's what a Christian is. One who is dead. And you say to your body, you're dead to me. So do you know him? Do you know the spirit of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God inside of you? If so, say amen. 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 Makes me feel better.